All right, I think uh, we're going to get started. Good evening and uh, welcome to PRS Grand Rounds on Facebook Live. Tonight we have the honor of discussing in, uh, safety and gluten augmentation with Dr. Peter Rubin, which is very topical and a true global safety concern. Dr. Rubin uh, is the chair of the Department of Plastic Surgery, the UPMC Endowed Professor of Plastic Surgery, Professor of Bioengineering at the University of Pittsburgh and co-faculty at the McGowan Institute of Regenerative Medicine. He serves as a co-director of the Adipose Stem Cell Center and is funded by the NIH and the Department of Defense, among many other organizations. Out of the many leadership roles, he's the vice president of the ASPS and the co-chair of the Multi-Society Gluteal Fat Grafting Task Force. And I couldn't, I could not think of a better person to discuss this topic with him with us. So thank you very, uh, very much, uh, Dr. Rubin. But before we begin, I would like to highlight the uh, uh, for the people who are joining us tonight, a few article collections uh, that have been collated to complement tonight's session. And these are both available for free on prsjournal.com and prsglobalopen.com. We also want to give a uh, big thanks to all of our current and past lecturers, as well as uh, all the people who participate in these grand rounds. We are so fortunate to be honored with the 2017 Eddie and Ozzy Award for the best use of social media platform. And this was for this very event, the PRS Grand Round on Facebook Live. As a reminder, all of the previous PRS uh, Grand Rounds uh, and the associated article collections can be found on the PRSJournal.com uh, under the Collections tab. And uh, then finally, don't forget that there is a Q&A following this lecture. And uh, this is a very fun uh, part of the event, unique uh, and a unique opportunity to ask uh, uh, your questions to uh, the master himself, Dr. Rubin. So please uh, send your questions in uh, by submitting them by the comment stream, and and then I'll be asking him the questions on your behalf. But without any further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Rubin, and thank you once again for joining us tonight. Francesco, thank you for that uh, very kind introduction, and it is uh, really a privilege to present uh, the PRS Grand Rounds. And we're going to be talking about gluteal fat grafting, uh, which has really uh, evolved as a patient safety crisis, both in the United States uh, and uh, throughout uh, the rest of the world. And we haven't seen in a while uh, such a significant and immediate threat. Uh, to patient safety as we are seeing uh, with uh, gluteal fat grafting. So recently, uh, and actually really over the last few years, we, we have started to see headlines in the news such as this that are very alarming and very concerning uh, relating to uh, reports of injury uh, and also mortality uh, from gluteal fat grafting. A very important article uh, published in the medical literature in 2017 highlighted findings and recommendations uh, from the ACERF uh, task force uh, that was looking at this uh, issue. And this is a very important uh, foundation data set uh, that, that really set the stage uh, for more involved and more in-depth exploration uh, into this issue. In this article, Dr. Mofid and colleagues uh, conducted a survey sent out to over 4,800 plastic surgeons uh, worldwide, and they collected data on uh, buttock fat grafting complications, and they also performed in-depth interviews with surgeons who had events as well as uh, attended autopsies and uh, reviewed autopsy reports. The results of this survey data really underscored the importance of this issue because they found that there were 25 fatalities uh, confirmed in, in the United States uh, over a five-year period. And <clears throat> through autopsy reports and interviews and medical, uh, uh, through uh, uh, autopsy reports and interviews with both surgeons and medical examiners, uh, they noted uh, that the, the leading cause of death was pulmonary fat embolism. And this happened uh, in, in a majority of the cases. We're going to circle back to 
some of the data points on the incidence in, a little bit later in the, in, the, uh, in the talk. But based on the survey data, that they tried to correlate some of the factors that, that could be helpful uh, in uh, helping to prevent these uh, catastrophic events. And they noted from their survey data that there were less complications if people reported having uh, stayed in the subcutaneous plane and using larger cannulas uh, that were less susceptible uh, to deflection and bending and that they were angling uh, the cannulas uh, away from the vessels. And, and again, this was a very important uh, foundation data. And as this was coming out, uh, we continued to see more very alarming headlines, some of them very heartbreaking, uh, about uh, very uh, dramatic uh, uh, complications and fatalities. Uh, some of these uh, related to uh, uh, clinics uh, rather than uh, hospitals uh, and uh, the certification uh, of the facilities where these procedures were being performed was, was not always uh, well known. Now we look further into the literature and we really look back at, at, at a series of complications. We look at uh, different uh, uh, cases, uh, and there was a report by uh, Dr. Cardenas uh, Camerana and colleagues uh, published in Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery that did an in-depth um, analysis of a series of deaths in Mexico and Colombia over a period of 10 to 15 years. And they were really looking at, at uh, deaths and, and the cause of these fatalities. And they identified a number of deaths in Mexico and Colombia. And they again uh, noted and, and highlighted that uh, fat embolism uh, was really the culprit here. And this picture from their article shows very clearly and very dramatically uh, a collection, a macroscopic collection of fat uh, in the vena cava uh, of a patient uh, who had. Uh, died during surgery. Now, when we talk about complications in fat grafting to the buttock, uh, we have to bear in mind that not all of the outcomes are bad and that the reason that uh, patients are having this operation is because in most cases uh, the outcomes are, are actually very favorable. Uh, Dr. Condi Green uh, in her systematic review of the literature and meta-analysis, looked broadly at complications from gluteal fat grafting and actually concluded when you look at, at the totality of cases uh, that this actually is an effective and predictable way uh, to remodel uh, gl the gluteal uh, contour. However, we need to, of course, understand and keep in mind these risks. A few points were very evident in their article. One point is that when they looked for high quality articles, uh, they didn't find very many that fit their criteria, 19 total articles, uh, underscoring the fact that we certainly meet, need more data. Uh, another very important point is that there was worldwide activity in gluteal fat grafting across North America, South America, uh, in the, the Middle East, uh, in Europe, uh, that there was really a lot of activity. And, and this was a problem uh, that really impacts plastic surgeons around the world. Interestingly, uh, when the authors looked at outcomes across a number of studies, a majority of patients were noted to have excellent or good satisfaction from their gluteal fat augmentation. They also noted, again, from these different papers, and, and of course, these are different levels of, of evidence. Uh, there are very few high level of evidence studies in this area. Uh, they noted that patients who reported staying in the subcutaneous plane uh, did report a lower number of complications. And when we look at the complications that are occurring uh, across the board, uh, a majority of these complications are on the more minor and self-limited side. So on one hand, 
we have this, this risk that's very high of a catastrophic outcome, uh, but many patients who are benefiting from this operation uh, and getting good results. Another publication by Sino and colleagues, uh, and this included Dr. Simeon Wall, uh, who is a, a very well-known uh, and, and respected body contouring surgeon, uh, looked at uh, a, syst a systematic review of outcomes and complications. So we have more of a deep dive into the literature. And they noted again uh, that the complication rates overall were not dramatically high. And in fact, when you compared this head-to-head -head with silicone augmentation of the gluteal region, that overall uh, fat grafting uh, was likely to have uh, fewer complications overall. Now again, we must bear in mind that the most catastrophic complications uh, of, of mortality uh, and severe injury uh, are still occurring with fat grafting uh, more so than, than buttock augmentation with silicone implants. Now we look at strategies where we can uh, potentially increase the safety, and that is really the key here. When we have a patient safety crisis, we want to start looking at ways in which we can improve patient safety. Really the key uh, goal uh, for all of us in the plastic surgery community. So we look at an article uh, by uh, several prominent surgeons, first authored by Dr. Villanueva, uh, including Dr. Dan Del Vecchio, uh, Dr. Paul Afruz, uh, Dr. Carboy, and Dr. Rod Rorick, uh, the editor of our journal. And they start by really pointing out the, the increase in procedures occurring uh, with uh, buttock fat graft. And it's interesting to note that in 2016, uh, there were 18,489 buttock fat grafting procedures performed. And by the way, by the most recent ASPS data, this is even higher, but this is going up year by year. So while we have these catastrophic outcomes that we need to prevent, we also have an increasing interest in this procedure, making the patient safety mission even more important. Because statistically, as the number of cases go up, we can have more of these catastrophic events if we don't really uh, get on top of these issues now. Now, in uh, the article by Villanueva and colleagues, uh, they noted uh, that uh, a good understanding of the anatomy, of patient selection, instrumentation, and uh, adherence to proper technique are all very important. And, and of course, this is, stands to reason uh, as true for any operation in plastic surgery, uh, most uh, certainly uh, with this operation. And this is really the kind of analysis that we need to be doing, because this operation has been done safely for decades by surgeons. And what has happened is that we've seen this increased interest in the procedure and increased numbers and more and more surgeons doing these, this procedure, some board certified, some not. And for all of our viewers uh, who, are, uh, who are not plastic surgeons uh, but may be looking at this material to understand more about this operation, uh, because uh, you're interested yourself or because family or friends are interested, understand that choosing a plastic surgeon uh, who is board certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery, and there are many boards out there, but the American Board of Plastic Surgery, and there's only one, is a, a mark of, of distinction for your surgeon uh, that they have uh, the finest training and they have passed a rigorous set of examinations. And that's also one of the points that I'll make. So our community of board certified plastic surgeons is really looking into this uh, issue. And striking uh, to note, and this is where we circle back to some of the data from MOFID's paper, and this is highlighted in the paper by Villanueva and colleagues, is that 
if you look statistically, this operation, while there are so many good outcomes, when, when things go wrong and when there are catastrophic outcomes, that rate uh, can actually be significantly higher than other cosmetic surgery procedures that we perform, uh, potentially as high as one in 3,500 cases. And that's a very, very high number for an elective cosmetic surgery procedure. So one of the keys that the authors point out is that we really have to look at the anatomy of the gluteal region and we have to understand where the vessels are arising and how to avoid the vessels. And the key cause of catastrophic outcomes is the surgeon's cannula uh, being uh, placed into an anatomic danger zone where there are significantly large venous structures and fat embolism results from that. So here in uh, the paper by Villanueva uh, and Del Vecchio and colleagues, uh, that they highlight that that understanding of the anatomy is, is really critical and they allude to being able to develop surface markings that can help guide the surgeon in staying out of the danger zones. And that's the triangle that you see here. And that's an important concept uh, that, as you'll see in a, in a few minutes, uh, that our uh, multi-society task force is, is pursuing to understand how these surface anatomy markings uh, can relate uh, to safer technique. And here again, we just see this, this uh, concept really emphasized uh, in, in this slide uh, that if we take away the underlying uh, anatomic diagrams, that we have these, these surface markings that can be uh, very helpful uh, relative to bony landmarks. So these authors concluded that there is technique, technical aspects that can make this operation safer. Uh, and help prevent these uh, catastrophes. And certainly that education of surgeons about the anatomy, about proper technique, is really going to be key in solving this crisis. And here we see in another paper by Dr. Del Vecchio and Wall, uh, I, I've excerpted this image that shows these surface markings drawn out uh, on a patient uh, so that they can guide uh, the, uh, the surgeon during the procedure. So where do we go from here? And what is our community of plastic surgeons doing? Well, this is an uncollaborative, uh, excuse me, a unprecedented uh, collaborative effort. It's a very collaborative effort uh, that, that uh, we haven't seen in a very long time. And we have five societies working together. The American Society of Plastic Surgeons, American Society of Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons, the International Society of Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons, the International Society of Plastic and Regenerative Surgery, and the International Federation of Adipose Therapeutics and Science. And this is a very important effort because this group was formed in 2017 with experts from all around the world to tackle these issues. I am very privileged to be a co-chair of this body along with Dr. Dan Mills, a past president of ASAPS, and Dr. Renato Saltz, who is the current president of ISAPS. So our uh, task force uh, dealt with some really key questions. And the first question is, is this operation inherently dangerous and do we need to stop doing this? And if we continue doing this procedure, how can we make it safer? And the overriding uh, consensus among the task force members uh, was that there are modifiable technical factors that can dramatically improve patient safety and reduce risk with this operation. And this can include technique and instrumentation. One of the first efforts of the task force was to release an advisory statement letting everybody know in our plastic surgery community around the world, and this was released simultaneously from all the societies, again, an unprecedented uh, effort that this is a problem. We need to pay attention. We need to focus on the cannula tip at all times. We need to be aware of that. We need to stay as far away from the gluteal vessels and sciatic nerve as possible. We need to use instrumentation that offer uh, uh, resistance to bending and deflection of the cannulas. 
and we need to keep the cannula in motion, and we need to discuss these risks with every patient. Moreover, we reference some articles that can be helpful. Now, this is a great start, but we need to dig deeper because we need tangible recommendations, scientifically founded, that we can apply and, and use to guide our community of plastic surgeons in keeping this operation safer. So the task force is in the process of conducting an anatomic study that correlates technique with proximity to anatomic danger zones. Again, in an unprecedented effort, we have joint funding from the Plastic Surgery Foundation of the ASPS, uh, the Aesthetic uh, Surgery Education and Research Foundation of ASAPS, uh, and ISAPS. And the three main societies have jointly funded this project, and we have three major aims of this study. We're going to determine proximity to the iliac veins and gluteal venous trunks with varying cannula angles from common incision port sites. We're going to map out all of these surgical approaches so that we know how to stay away from these danger zones. We're going to model the operation in five cadavers with five experienced surgeons who have been doing this successfully without morbidity. And then most importantly, we're going to create an educational tool to teach the safety lessons to the plastic surgery community. And we're going to do this mapping through all of the common port sites that we're aware of. We had to develop nomenclature to describe the angles of approach so we can communicate this uh, as we're doing the studies and after we're doing the studies, both in the, uh, in the horizontal plane and the vertical plane. So again, we can describe these techniques with great precision. We can measure these angles of approach experimentally during the studies. And very importantly, we can fill the vessels of the cadavers with contrast so that we can actually image them with real-time fluoroscopy during the study, and we can look at how to stay away from these danger zones. The other interesting innovation that we're applying for this study is to use fat that is dyed with different colors so that we can actually track the fat once we're injected. And we have a a wonderful members of our of our team, uh, Dr. Oni Garcia and Dr. Pat Pasmino in Miami. Uh, they are our boots on the ground because we're doing the study at an anatomic research center in Miami. Uh, have really been spearheading uh, uh, the uh, refinement of these methods. And here we see uh, labeled fat, dyed fat in a cadaver specimen, and we can actually track where we inject this. So, in conclusion. This is a real safety issue. We want everybody to know that our plastic surgery community is working diligently on this uh, task of making this operation safer to protect our patients. We are working through this scientific study very quickly, and we hope uh, by the fall uh, to have good data and good recommendations uh, born out of strong science that we can use to guide our practice. I want to remind all of our surgeons uh, that data collection is really key. If you're a plastic surgeon, please uh, sign up for and enroll data in the graft registry. I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ruben, uh, for a truly epic lecture. It's a very important topic, and um, and uh, we're delighted to, to see that uh, uh, we had lots of viewers, lots of questions, Fantastic. and so I hope uh, I hope you don't mind. But I'll be putting you. I'm delighted. You on, I'm delighted. I will be putting you on the hot seat and ask you Perfect. some of the questions uh, that that uh, um, our listeners have submitted during the lectures. I'll start with our editor in chief, Dr. Rorick. Uh, and he asked, were all the fatalities in this ASJ survey study done by board-certified plastic surgeons? Uh, no. A and um, we know uh, that as we dig deeper into the data, uh, that it is becoming apparent. And, and it's not just from the ASJ survey. The ASJ survey did go out to all board-certified plastic surgeons. But as we have become aware of cases, and investigated these cases, we know that not all of these are in the hands of board-certified plastic surgeons. And it's one of the problems and one of the key messages uh, to our, our viewers, our listeners, uh, who, who are patients uh, or, or potential patients, is that uh, you need to choose 
a surgeon who's certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery. Thank you. And then uh, from uh, Nick Phillips, uh, she's uh, one of the other resident ambassadors, and she asks, what information should we be sharing with patients about the risks and benefits of this procedure? That's a great question. And as per our task force statement, uh, we really need to make patients aware that yes, their fatalities have, have, have happened with this procedure. And that is something that, that, is, that is possible. Uh, now the benefits, as, as I showed from these wonderful publications, uh, most of the patients are getting really good benefits from this procedure and, and their goals appear to be met. Remember, we're doing a lot of these procedures uh, in the U.S. And, and internationally now, and the number is only growing. So the patient demand is there, and a majority of the patients are having favorable outcomes. We really need to control the safety issues that are leading to catastrophic outcomes. And then we have Antonio Ramirez Rosero uh, writing uh, in Spanish, uh, so not just from the United States. So. Fantastic. I'll leave it to you <laughs> to uh, translate for me. So what, what, what he's asking, he, well, what he's actually commenting, and he's saying that he has been performing uh, uh, gluteal augmentation with fat transfer uh, for a long time, and he injects uh, both subcutaneously and intramuscularly uh, superficially mm -hmm. uh, uh, with blunt cannulas. Uh, he says that he doesn't have... He hasn't had any complications with this procedure compared to, uh, for example, um, uh, prosthesis augmentation with the silicone right, prosthesis. Right, right. Exactly. And, and what is his question? Or is he making a comment? Hey, that, that was his yes. comment. And, and, and I will echo that comment that we have uh, surgeons, very experienced surgeons, who have been doing this operation safely for a long time. And they really understand the anatomy. They really understand the technique. And what we've seen over recent years is that as the, the patient demand is growing, that more and more surgeons are doing this without the same level of experience. Uh, and many people performing this operation now are, are not board certified plastic surgeons. We need to, through the work of our task force, uh, through our publications, uh, through our teaching courses, uh, we need to make sure that everyone doing this procedure has a really strong understanding of the anatomy and that we can make really solid recommendations that are going to keep our, our patients safe. Uh, so this, this doctor who, who wrote to us uh, is one of many with great experience who's doing this operation safely. And in fact, in our task force study, we are modeling this operation uh, with surgeons, performed by surgeons, uh, who are also doing this safely and are experts in this area. Thank you. And then we have Ira Savetsky, one of the other resident ambassadors, and he's asking, what tips do you recommend for individuals who are first starting out doing this procedure? Uh, first and foremost, uh, understand the anatomy. Read the literature. Dig really deeply into the literature. Understand the anatomy. Understand the potential pitfalls, why they're happening. Uh, look at videos uh, of the procedure being done by experienced surgeons uh, that are in our literature and go visit an experienced surgeon who's doing the procedure safely so that you really work up your knowledge base and you do everything you can to have a thorough understanding of the anatomy, the physiology, the technique, and, and you actually get to spend time with someone uh, who is doing the operation safely. It's the same way you would learn any operation. Next we have Gianfranco Frojo, and he's asking personal preferences on size, type of cannula, harvest technique, lipofilling technique, and maximum volume injected. Shall, do you want another presentation? Shall we put yes, on Dr. Frojo. Uh, <laughs> this will be next month's. This will be next month's PRS grammar. You know, these are these are wonderful, these are wonderful questions. And, um, you know, again, it could be an entire presentation. Um, I personally uh, use a decanting method. Uh, I use machine-powered harvest. Uh, while many people will use an infusion pump, I do syringe injection. I use shorter, blunt cannulas, uh, and I always am so careful about keeping track of where that cannula tip is and how things are angled. 
Uh, personally, I stay in the subcutaneous plane, uh, but uh, many of our colleagues, like, like our friend who, who wrote in uh, in, uh, in Spanish, uh, uh, understand the anatomy well enough uh, to do some work in the muscle uh, and to stay safe. This is, some, this is still an area of controversy and something that we're looking at carefully in our anatomic studies. Next, we have uh, Dr. Rorick again, and he's asking, was there a fatality correlation to volume of fat injected as well as depth? In other words, higher fatality if fat is injected intramuscularly. Oh, that's a very good question. So um, in all of the cases, despite in the cases of fatalities, despite where the surgeon thought they were injecting, the, the, despite whatever plane they thought they were in, uh, fat is, is in the deep planes in the danger zone. That we know. Now, in uh, many of these reports, there have been reports of fatalities with smaller volumes, that, that uh, uh, the surgeon was only 200 cc's into the procedure. Now, uh, one can argue, however, that uh, that was still the beginning of the case, and they may have started in the deep planes and been working more superficially. Uh, so we can't say for sure that if you're planning to do 800 or 1,000 cc's per hemibuttock, that that's necessarily more dangerous than doing smaller amounts. It's, it, you really need to stay out of those anatomic danger zones. And uh, we have a, a, an evolving body of literature, and the work of the task force and the anatomic studies that we're doing are, are going to be very key in elucidating uh, these approaches and staying safe. Next, we have Aris Salibian, and uh, he's asking, as we continue to define key principles for safety, what do you think are the best ways to spread this information to practice in plastic surgeons around the world to ensure adherence to these guidelines and decrease mor morbidity and mortality? Well, I, I, that's a wonderful question, and education is really key. And once uh, we develop new guidelines and recommendations from the work of our task force from this group of experts, we're going to make sure that's distributed far and wide. And this is going to be through all of the societies that are participating, through all of their distribution mechanisms, through the websites. Uh, we anticipate broad publication uh, in many forums. And you're going to see all of the major societies having instructional courses, cadaver courses, a real focus on the education. So it's, it's a big effort to do that. It's not a singular event. Uh, but it's an, it will be an ongoing and widespread effort. Next, we have uh, Christopher Holmesy, and uh, he asks, do you have a limit of fat injection volume that you never go above? Uh, no, to answer Dr. Holmesy's question, I don't. Uh, and I think that limit has to be uh, individualized for every patient, and you're going to have patients with all different body types, uh, different BMIs, different frames, and uh, you really just have to individualize that. I, I, I don't think that, that there's a, uh, a set limit uh, that, that you can never go above. I, I, I personally have patients where I've, I've put very large volumes in uh, and they had a body frame that could handle that very well. And I've had patients with uh, smaller frames where I, I you know, wouldn't go beyond uh, six or 700 cc's per hemibody. I'm delighted to see some of our UPMC attendings uh, also online. We have Dr. Unatkat, and uh, he asks, are the size or, or position of the gluteal veins same in a thin person versus an athletic muscular person who does regular squats and or is a runner? Uh, wonderful question from Dr. Unatkat. Uh, a shout out to our, our pit crew. <laughs> uh, we don't know the answer to that. And, uh, you know, it, it's one of the questions that, that we're really digging into. What is the variation in the location, the branching pattern, and the size of these vessels? And that, that's part of the work that we're doing uh, to elucidate this. He also asked, would this affect the technical risk uh, of gluteal augmentation, in your opinion? You know, I, I think that uh, uh, regardless of the size of the vessels, that they're potentially bigger in an athlete, uh, we know that even in people who are not athletes, they are big enough to be uh, subject to a, a portal of entry for fat embolism. And I think that, that defining 
those danger zones and the technique to stay away from them is going to be most important for every patient, uh, regardless of, of whether they may be an athlete and, and have larger veins or dilated veins. But those are factors that we're looking into, and it's a, it's a great question. And he has one more question. He asks, of the patients who died, were there any patterns of exercise-induced muscular hypertrophy? Um, not that we know of. I, I don't think that's a question that we have an answer to. So, for example, are, are people who work out a lot, uh, are, are they more prone to this complication? Uh, and, and we just don't know the answer to that. And then uh, we have Viri Gamar, uh, who's asking, what factors affect the percentage of fat surviving uh, of GRAF? Um, so, uh, uh, again, that, that'll be, uh, so now let's see, we have PRS Grand Rounds for um, July, uh, will be on harvest techniques, <laughs> PRS Grand Rounds for August will be on factors that impact People uh, love fat, Dr. Ruben. For, I People know, love I fat. know. Well, fat is our future. Uh, that's a wonderful question. And, uh, you know, th there are many uh, factors, including, uh, you know, it, it really relates to the vascularity surrounding the fat tissue that, that we put in. Uh, there, there are people uh, like Roger Corey, who, who uh, really, and Dan Del Vecchio also, who talk about a graft-to-recipient ratio. Uh, there are factors involved in the processing of the fat. There are biologic factors uh, that vary from patient to patient. There are numerous factors here. And I think what, what it really matters is that when you're doing this procedure, uh, that you have an effect efficient and, and reproducible uh, a process uh, for harvesting the fat, for processing the fat, uh, and for safely injecting the fat. And there's always going to be variation based on all of these, all of these different factors. Next, we have Rufino Irribaren. Uh, he's asking um, uh, whether varicose veins and hemorrhoids are exclusion criteria for uh, gluten fat grafting. Uh, for augmentation purposes? Oh, very, very good question. Um, so varicose veins um, that are not in the gluteal region uh, certainly have a different mechanism uh, with deficient uh, valve, uh, valves and uh, venous return. Uh, and I wouldn't consider that a contraindication. Uh, hemorrhoids, that's a, a really good question. And uh, again, I don't think anyone's really looked into that. Uh, to see if, if that would uh, would make a difference, knowing understanding the venous drainage uh, uh, in the uh, uh, rectal area, um, I, I I'm not sure what the answer would be. It's, it's an excellent question. Next we have Aaron Stone, and um, the question is: Is IUD a contraindication? What about use of an injection or a gun? Mm. So it's unknown whether IUD is a, is a contraindication. I, um, <clears throat> other than the, uh, if it's an IUD that involves hormonal therapy, uh, there may be a rationale for that. Uh, but I, otherwise, I, I don't know uh, that that is correlated at all. Uh, use of an injection gun, uh, that is, is, is a really good question. And there are no contraindications uh, right now for method for any of these methods of injection. So there's no contraindication for using an effusion pump, there's no contraindication to using an injection gun, uh, and there's no contraindication to syringe injection. So these are all techniques that are being used successfully and safely right now. Next we have uh, Jose Herboso from Argentina. And uh, he's asking, how does the injection pressure of the fat graft uh, influence the increased risk of uh, pulmonary embolism? Mm. So that that's a <clears throat> that's a very good that's a very good question as well. So there is a a theory uh, that even if you don't inject the veins uh, directly, that if there's injury or laceration to the veins, uh, that uh, a high pressure gradient between the injected fat uh, and the venous structures could potentially uh, uh, cause fat to be drawn into the vessels. Uh, that, that has not been uh, proven. Uh, it is right now theoretical, uh, but possible 
uh, but but we don't know that. Now we we uh, we know that <clears throat> pressure uh, once the fat is injected, uh, that uh, pressure is going to dissipate through the subcutaneous planes and even in the muscle planes to some degree. Otherwise, you're going to get tissue necrosis. Uh, but while the fat is being injected, creating a high pressure gradient around a major venous structure may be an issue. And uh, as I mentioned before, what we do know is that the catastrophic outcomes, the fatalities, are associated with uh, fat embolism and injury to the major trunks of the gluteal veins where they meet the iliac vein. So it's, it's the major trunks of the veins in the deep regions. And that's where we need to stay out of with our cannulas. Next, we have a question from Nueva Imagen uh, Cirropia Plastica Monterrey. And they're asking, would you give us your personal recommendations about post-op care for these patients? Ah, my personal recommendation. So again, this is this is um, a, an area of controversy. Do you let them sit? Do you not let them sit? So first of all, uh, of course, I let these patients ambulate. Uh, in terms of compression, I favor very light compression, uh, just some spandex exercise gear. And I try to have them uh, avoid uh, prolonged uh, sitting or reclining. Of course, it's almost impossible to do, uh, but at least early on, I have them try to offload pressure from that region. Now, interestingly, when a patient is sitting straight up, uh, they're actually uh, uh, really sort of below that. They're, they're on their ischia, ischial tuberosities, uh, and that's a little bit better, actually, than, than, than reclining, being in a reclining position. Uh, but this is, uh, you know, also an area where where five different surgeons will, are going to give you six different answers. <laughs> Next, we have uh, Jorge Eduardo Molina Ortega, and uh, he's asking: Is there any correlation uh, between velocity of fat uh, application or injection and uh, fat embolism? Uh, so, how rapidly you inject? Yeah. Uh, no, there's no correlation. Okay. And next, we have Lily Mundi. Uh, she's asking, do you have a preferred method of preparing fat for grafting? So for large volume fat grafting, my personal preferred method is a decanting method uh, because I, I believe that for large volume fat grafting, uh, that is the most efficient way to process the fat. Uh, and I can use machine harvest or, or machine powered negative pressure harvest uh, and I can very rapidly do the decanting, and it makes the workflow much more efficient. Uh, but as we know, and, and from survey data that uh, my group has published and other groups have published, uh, there's a lot of variation in how we do this and how we practice. And we don't have enough evidence to say that there's an absolute one single right way to do this. Thank you. And the next question, and I apologize if I butcher your name, but... Uh, is from King Mu Asadamon Ko. And uh, the question is, so far, uh, based on the evidence, do you feel that silicon implant is safer than fat injection for gluteal augmentation? So is, is the use of a silicone implants uh, safer? Uh, it, it's a little bit difficult to answer that. Uh, and the reason it's difficult to answer is that, is that is that while we don't have the, the same uh, catastrophic uh, outcomes uh, from, silicone, uh, from silicone implants, uh, they're still associated uh, with a fairly high complication rate. And what we really need to do and so is to get that complication rate under control, the catastrophic complication rate for fat grafting. So patients, uh, excuse me, surgeons who are very experienced in gluteal fat grafting uh, are, are, going, are reporting complication rates that are overall lower than silicone implants. And of course, these are the surgeons who are not having fat embolism and, and uh, fatal uh, catastrophic events. Next question is from Shabir Ahmad uh, Wani. And the question is about positioning. Uh, 
the question is, uh, does post-operative position affect the fat survival? Should we keep all patients in the prone position? I, my personal philosophy on this is that if we can unload the fat, if we can keep pressure off that fat early on, uh, that that's going to be beneficial. I, I think it's almost impossible to keep patients in a prone position all the time, you know, either prone or standing. Uh, but I certainly advise them to limit the amount of time uh, that they're in the supine position or the reclining uh, position. And, and so we have to do, at the end of the day, what's realistic for our patients. We can also use foam donuts. Um, those can be helpful. Foam devices can be helpful. But I think the, whole, the key point is whatever you can do to help your patients keep pressure off of that area, especially early on, is, is uh, going to be beneficial. And then one last question by Otav, uh, Otavio Queiroz, uh, who's asking, do you do glute augmentation in hospital uh, setting or in the office uh, setting? Mm. So I actually do all of my uh, surgery in a hospital setting, and that's just the nature of my practice and my university uh, where, um, uh, where I practice. Uh, is it reasonable to do this in a certified surgery center with all of the appropriate safety measures in place? Uh, absolutely. Uh, my personal practice is, is hospital-based, uh, but it, it, there are many people doing this very safely in well-certified and qualified uh, surgery centers. That was actually a trick. It wasn't very the very last question. I'm sorry. We, we just got a one very final one. Ah, we'll do one final question. One final question. And, uh, and, and Francesco and Dr. Rorick, I, I'm just so delighted uh, to see the interest in this topic and all of the robust discussion. I wish we had another 45 minutes to do Q&A <laughs> well, and because we have that many questions rolling it, it through. Will be, it will be for another grand rounds. We'll Fantastic. organize another grand rounds. But the, the final question is, what is the patient takeaway here? from your lecture? Uh, the takeaway... The, for the patients. Ah, the takeaway for the patient. Uh, I'm, going to give, I'm going to give a few takeaway messages. One is that gluteal fat grafting is growing in popularity. More and more procedures are being done, and a majority of patients uh, appear to be having uh, outcomes that, that are uh, a, a satisfac satisfactory or better, that are good to excellent. Uh, we also recognize that there's a real patient safety issue here, that yes, there, there are, are uh, patients uh, who are having fatal outcomes from this procedure, and that's really important to recognize. Uh, and, and the uh, third take-home mes message for patients is that when you are choosing a plastic surgeon, you should be choosing a surgeon who's certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery. And there are many other boards out there, but the American Board of Plastic Surgery is the important mark of distinction that says that your surgeon has finished an accredited residency training program and has passed a rigorous set of exams. Now, outside of the United States, in other countries, there are similar qualifications and distinctions uh, that uh, will let you know that your surgeon uh, has the most rigorous training and the most rigorous qualifications. And, and that's going to be uh, different in countries, different countries. I, in, in the U.S., I, I can speak clearly to the American Board of Plastic Surgery, uh, but most certainly uh, outside of the U.S., there are other surgeons with similar qualifications. But that is really important. Well, with this, we'll, uh, we'll end our, this uh, phenomenal PRS uh, grand round. I would like to thank you so much, Dr. Ruben, for uh, spending the evening with us. And to all our listeners, I hope you found it educational. Thank you so much for all the questions and your interest in this topic, which is truly becoming a global crisis. Yeah. Uh, I would like to, rem to remind everyone that we have the PRS Journal Club uh, um, uh, which again is on Facebook and it will be on June 24. Please join us, uh, read the article and ask lots of questions there as well. Uh, 
Uh, I would like to thank the journal for giving us uh, giving us this opportunity of discussing this great topic, and uh, also Dr. Rorick and the resident ambassadors and the whole staff and team for uh, arranging this uh, this uh, PRS Grand Round. And and to Francesco and Dr. Rorick and and everyone uh, who tuned in today, uh, thank you so much for the privilege of uh, giving this presentation uh, and uh, uh, for having. Uh, and I'm grateful for the robust discussion that we had. Great. Thank you, Dr. Rubin. Thank you all. Bye-bye.